This week, we're talking about the rate of force development. We're going to look at how to produce a force as fast as possible. By the way, I'm at the beach, so there's some funny pictures behind me, but, you know, I still want to get my work done for you guys so we can continue to learn. We're going to look at RFD. I'm going to define it for you guys. Rate of force development, RFD. Well, I'll just say RFD from here on out. Muscle length tension relationship. We'll look at that and how it comes into play. Voluntary versus passive force elastic components in the body and how they come into play passive plus voluntary force equals max force we'll show you how that works and the principle of specificity to maximize rfd then we're going to measure rfd and we're going to look at motor unit recruitment and rate coding for really maximizing oh by the way this over here is some of my own work from this past week even though I'm at the beach I'm still working and I'm using myself as a guinea pig for rate of force development I'm going to measure it now later this is just all going to be fun as we do this series on adaptations to different stimuli all right we're going to define RFD rate of force development so a force you know equals mass times acceleration for maximum force, you need three, th three. Sorry, we need three things. We need maximum effort, maximum velocity, and finally a slowing of the movement. Meaning, like you're going so heavy that the bar slows down. So we're looking at somewhere 0.3 meters per second or slower for really grinding and to produce maximum force. So RFD equals how fast one can produce a peak force. It's great to produce force, but like for athlete. Af Athletes, football players, softball players, sprinters, you got to be able to produce maximum force as quickly as possible. And those are the people that really we watch on Sundays if you're watching the NFL or if you're watching the NBA. So thought to be expressed uh, during the short stretch shortening cycle, you know, like when the foot hits the ground, how quickly that, that Achilles absorbs that force and transfers it down the, the um, track. A fast as you know stress shortening cycle would be something like sprinting, bounding, like a depth jump, if you're good at depth jump. Because sometimes people's ground contact time is a little bit slower. And we'll show you how we're gonna classify fast and not fast with SSC. And then a slow one would be a counter movement jump or a depth jump if you're not good at it. Anyway, to classify it, movements that take less than 250 milliseconds, meaning when your foot strikes the ground, or to you know to you know, transition from you know a stretch to a force production something that takes less than 250 milliseconds you guys have probably heard ground contact time and we'll talk about that more in a bit something slow you know that that uh, contraction is going to take 250 milliseconds or more the muscle length tension relationship Let's talk about that a little bit. I'm going to try to make this as simple as possible because Sam at Jimmyware, she's our data person, our sports scientist. Uh, she said I went maybe a little too deep, so I've, I've, I've kind of like simplified it for you. But anyway, we're talking about the muscle length tension relationship. You're thinking about the sarcomere, the you know the structural unit of a muscle cell. It, you know, you've probably heard actin and mycin. If you've taken a, if you've got your uh, um, your, your CSCS, you know exactly what I'm talking about. But as, if you want to look over here, let's just talk about it. Like with, you know, the actin and mycin, we're talking about the sliding uh, filament theory, about the sliding filament theory. So like when calcium shows up, there's a side on actin that opens up and mycin is attracted to it, latches on, and does not turn, the power stroke and contraction happens. But here's the thing, is that when they're too far, see down here, when it's when they're too far, uh, when the muscle is completely lifted, the myosin can't make a cross bridge, bridge and grab any actin, so it's really hard to reduce force. Uh, same thing goes when the muscle is fully contracted. Think about flexing your bicep. They push up against each other, so not much force can happen. So when uh, the problem is, is that I mean, the thing is, is that it's not just about you know, the actin and mycin, that's not everything when it comes to creating force. There's also passive force like tighten, tendons, connective tissue, nerves, 
And, so, and then there's also adaptations in the neuromuscular system itself. And by the way, the Titan. Um, if you want to, we're going to, well, on the next page, we'll talk more about Titan, but it's a pretty important protein. And for athletes, it's super important. So let's take a look. Titan is this, as you see, is this little strand of proteins that, well, I shouldn't say little, in the body, it's the biggest protein we have. But it basically keeps things together and like it keeps the myosin connected so things just can't move around so if tighten what it does is when you're stretching like say doing a squat it resists that stretch so it if you talk about elasticity you see people that seem like they can just kind of bounce out of the bottom like a like a basketball Titan's a big responsibility for that and then also tendons is a huge help connective tissue and then with the stretch shortening cycle, I kind of got it documented over here a little bit, but there's two things that come into play, a muscle spindle and a Golgi tendon organ. What happens when you, when you say when you do a squat and those, those um, muscle fibers are being lengthened, the muscle spindles run parallel with those muscle fibers and they, they sense a stretch. And when, so the muscle spindles send an afferent message just to the spinal cord and then it, in return, afferent message is sent to contract the harder that message i mean the faster you do that stretch and the more force that the muscle spindles are detecting the more powerful and the, and the faster the contraction it's super fast because it doesn't have to go up the spinal cord to the brain and back down simply to the spinal cord and back to the muscles so it's pretty intense and then the golgi tendon organ quite the opposite but what that does in the tendon senses a lot of force. Say if you were to play football and you planted your foot and the body perceived that as excessive force, it shuts you down and trying to, well, it's, it's trying to avoid tearing. So it's a, it's a good thing at times, but it can be a pain if you're trying to get strong in the weight room. But the better you get at certain movements like squatting, like a clean, the less chance that that Golgi tendon organ, GTO, is going to send um, an inhibition. It's really, doesn't, it sends the sa you know, same type of message, just like the muscle spindles. But in, in return, the front message says, shut down. It tells your muscles to stop working to prevent a tear. Over time, there's less inhibition, and there's way more of what the muscle spindle does. And together, you get a massive stretch shortening cycle. So it's a, a massive, passive um, production of force. And tight tendons, you know, if, if you've ever, uh, if you follow me on Master Elite, you probably talked to Keith Barr, you watched the, the podcast there, and learned how important tendons are. And the thicker and tighter a tendon is, like when you, say, when you stick your foot in the ground, uh, into the floor to propel yourself up in a vertical leap, the less it you know, the less it gives and the more power is returned to the body. And you get, it's like a spring effect. You know, like if you're a rubber band, if you hold it for a long time, it gets weak and frays. But if I pull it back and, and let it go, it's going to give a lot of power. So um, connected tissue all around, you know, uh, as long as, as, by the way, all tissue responds to training it can adapt and the stronger and thicker any connective tissue gets the more force is produced and the less is, and the less amount that's lost so uh, training these components leads to improvements in rfd so if the more i do say for example like when i go heavy versus like you know 30 reps at a low percentage both of them produce a lot of hypertrophy however you're going heavy, it produces um, a more. The bottom line is you're going to find when we go over specificity, if you train explosively and you work on bounding and you train like I'm about to tell you, that's going to really um, cause some great qualities to happen in the tendons and connective tissue, you can improve these things. And we can create maximum force at a very high rate. Specificity. Basically, however you train is what you're going to become. So if you train fast, you'll be fast. If you train slow, you'll be slow, and you know that. So, but train explosive to be to become explosive. 
high velocity or maximum velocity is important. That's where Jim Weir comes in. You can actually make sure that you're in the ranges you need to be in to improve the rate of force development that you're after. You need to make sure you use maximal effort, which is another reason why I love Jim Weir because it, it makes sure that the intent is being met. Um, bands, I got to give a shout out to bands because what happens is bands will make any intensity move quicker, not to mention it speeds up the eccentric. And so that's a good way to to um, improve the qualities of tightening. So strengthen them, tighten them, make them thicker and stronger. So bounding, depth jumps. Uh, we do depth jumps a lot, and we're weightlifters, but it's really been um, awesome for improving the elasticity of our weightlifters. Jump rope, a simple thing that seems to be gone, um, lost in the past, I guess. And sprints. So that's why sprinting, you get better at sprinting, but you're also improving rate of force development and you're improving the quality and thickness of tendons, also the tighten and all those other elastic components. Um, just a tip, isometrics at a very long muscle length is really good for tendon quality. So I think we talked about that last time with um, the force velocity curve. So velocity based training to ensure intent and to make sure you're measuring. And we're going to show you how to measure it in a little bit. And then training at high velocities, especially I feel with bands, improves rate coding, rate coding because it's an adaptation because it's really hard to produce high amounts of force at, you know, at those high rates because the cross, they can't form enough cross bridges in there of the actinomycin of the sarcomere. So the body adapts by improving the rate coding, which is the speed of which it sends the signal from the brain to the muscles to contract. So Cool adaptation. Uh, motor unit recruitment and rate coding. So a motor unit is, uh, the definition is any alpha neuron in all the muscle fibers that it innervates. And so there's a lot of, you know, slow, low threshold motor units and recruit 10, something that takes simple, like all day long you're using those. But high threshold motor units requires a maximum effort and velocity to be recruited. And those are inter they innervate 300, 500, even up to 1,000 um, muscle fibers. So, right, co coding, that's how quickly we already said it. So, now we're going to talk about measuring RFD. Uh, average rate of force development equals the peak force divided by the time to peak force in milliseconds. Simple. Now, obviously, you got to convert that uh, to seconds for the formula. Uh, there's also there's also interval RFD if you have something like an isometric mid thigh pull and some and some force plates. So zero to fifty millis milliseconds, fifty to hundred, and so forth. So you can see that you can if you do it in intervals, you can get a lot of great information. So like for example, the peak rate of force development, you have to look at the change, you know, so from fifty to hundred, the change was four hundred and forty newtons. So that would be your peak change. So to find that out, you simply divide four forty by point zero five, and you're going to get eight thousand eight hundred newton seconds to the negative one is what you come up with. Or it's time to peak rate of force development. You simply can take, you can measure the time it took you to get to that peak, which is a hundred milliseconds. And then, like I said uh, earlier, you can look, if you want to know the average rate of force development, you see top force, the peak force that was produced, which is 1,460 newtons, divided by the 250 milliseconds it, it took to get there, and then what you're going to get is 5, 000, a rate of force development at 5,840 newton second um, to negative one. So I have something that can um, do it in intervals. You can get a lot of good information. However, I don't think you need to do all of that to improve in the gym. So here's what I recommend. Pick major movements to test and to track, like squat, the clean, the bench, like a drop jump, which um, the gym warrior can do. Create a T-score. It means you take your team. So if you have a team 30-plus people or more, if you coach football hundreds, and you find out where they rank amongst the team, and then you'll see who needs to work on rate of force development and who doesn't. You know, if someone is at the top of the food chain when it comes to RFD, 
then you can do other things, get them strong, keep them safe. But uh, the people at the bottom, there's plenty. Or just continue to improve everyone because can there be too much of a rate of force development? I don't think so. So trying to, you know, what you want to do is train to improvement and track. I did that myself, as you can see. Like here we did, um, you know, this was benching the other day and I did 3,982.48 was my peak in my bench press with bands. And so with with the gym where I can look and see that it took 0.76 you know, um, seconds to get there or you know, 76 milliseconds to get there and I can figure out what my um, RFD which I did is 5,239 so then I can improve it so like I can train explosively I can use bands I can um, train at a very high velocity you know somewhere you know no lower than accelerated strength maybe um, stress speed or speed strength and I can improve that number. And four weeks from now, I can see did my work improve. You know, I could if you want to improve upper body, which is what I this is bench press. Maybe I want to do like uh, depth push-ups. Like start on we've all done those. Start on a box, drop down, hit the ground, and get off the floor as fast as quickly as possible. Once again, the bounding. You know, the faster the movements, those are really going to be the ones that affect tendons and the connective tissue more. And of course, the stretch reflex the you know, the neuromuscular junction, those things are going to be what really improves the rate of force development. So and this is my profile. I'm going to be doing this as we do this whole uh, series on adaptations for stimuli. And I'm going to, every time we talk about a different adaptation from a certain stimulus, I'm going to show you what I've been working on uh, with Timberware or my Flex to improve that adaptation. In conclusion, if power and speed are important to your sport, in your sport, RFD is a solid parameter to check. I mean, producing force as quickly as possible is, in, is really important. So specificity rules. So if you want to be fast, train fast, at least train fast often uh, as part of the routine. Strength is still important. Don't get me wrong. So like, and also like. Um, as long as you're trying to produce as much force as possible, as quickly as possible, you're going to get better RFD. So um, use Gym Aware to measure, ensure maximal velocity and effort, and track it. If you have any questions, contact me at Travis at GymAware.com and uh, go to Gym Aware to, do, to learn and to keep up with all of these that we're going to be doing in this series of adaptations to stimuli in the future. So if you have something you want me to to dig deep on and to you know elaborate on for you guys, let me know. I'd love to you know I want to this is for you guys. I want to give you what you want. So thank you.